Okay, so a very good afternoon everyone. I will usually keep this short and sweet as possible. So for your first lab, what we're going to do is look a bit more detail on to scientific experimental design, more specifically for marine ecology. Now, I believe all of you have learned this back in school. You have had some exposure already in your second year, uh, within the third semester, for your field sampling trips and whatnot. So right now, what I want you to do is use that experience, um, use all the applied science that you've learned back in your childhood, in your school times, right up to where you are now, and uh, learn to extrapolate certain things, um, you know, for in terms of analysis from the start of your sampling trip right up towards having to publish work. So um, what I'm going to be doing is, prior to me moving into this, I just want to have a little recap if you remember some of the things that you did during your field trip. So the one on the left, did you guys do this? On the boat? Yes, Otter. Okay, what do you, what what is this called? Filter. Huh? Yeah, okay, all right. All right. Filter, but um what sort of filter is this? And how is it different from the one on the right? Plankton net. Plankton net. Okay, plankton net is the one on the right. Good. How about the one on the left? Bongo net. No, it's not. Notice how it's in a series. So the Serial net. Yes, clever. So which one is bongo net then? Yang the round one. But... Yang macam mana? Hello, Brendan. Okay, <laughs> which one is the bongo net? Ingat tak? How does the bongo net look like? Um, um besar. Dari dua something. Correct. Like how a bongo drum, it has two parts, right? Yes, correct. So that uh basically is the one that you were towing for your uh for for plankton. So you put it at. The front or the back of the boat? Back of the boat. Okay. The back. All right. Why? Why at the back, not the front? Because we will be towing the bongo net from behind the boat. Correct. Good. So absolutely wonderful. The fact that all three of these are, in a way, plankton nets. Why? Why can't we just use one? Why do we need to use different nets? For different types of plankton. Okay, can can you elaborate that a little bit more? You're getting there. Uh, if uh, for bongo net, I think it's for both zooplankton and phy phytoplankton. Eh, ah. Eh, ah. <laughs> you don't sound very confident <laughs> with your answer. Which is which? Wait, okay. let me confirm. Okay, Siti Nabila says organisms have different type of size. Very good. So the cereal filter net actually has different mesh sizes. So, okay, that you're focusing into different uh, sizes. So then the bongo net, uh, one is for fighter, one is for zoo. Okay, the bongo net usually has a bigger mesh size. So that one traps um, bigger, uh, and uh, what do you call this, plankton and more specifically zooplankton. So the ones that you're seeing here is for phyto, but also can be used for microplastics. Again, it it's it varies, but the fact that they all are nets, but for different purposes is what you need to know. So I can understand that during your time at the field trip, we as facilitators, we actually sort of told you what to do. So what we really wanted you all to achieve during your field trip was so that you will have hands-on experience. But I can also understand that you may not necessarily know what you were doing and what was it for. So the purpose for me having this particular session 
It might be very small, but it's very critical because I want you to relate all of your experiences to put it to good use and so that when you transition from now to your final year project, you will have a better understanding of not just blindly doing things because you were told to, but to start critically thinking why you have to do it, uh, what is the purpose of you doing it, and if in the circumstance you have uh, lack of, say, facilities or something is broken or something, can you find a solution? Can you find an alternative? This is the, this is the time you have to start thinking, thinking very critically. All right. So again, this is a transition that helps you in your final year project as well. Um, how about this one? Um, anybody knows what, uh, well, Dr. Hafiz is doing here. Now, it is ID and the one on the right. The right is very straightforward, right? What is the one on the right? This one. Thirty days. Very good for measuring water turbidity. Very good. All right, and the one on the left. Very good, Amila. Okay, and Urfan, thank you. The one on the what is uh, Doctor Hafiz doing? Oh, probably it's not very clear. But they were ID. Okay, ID, yeah, correct, right, uh, trying to ID specimens. Usually, Dr. Hafiz is always in charge of the benthic uh, sledge. How about Inji's ID? Semua dah lupa bagian ni ke? Chlorophyll. Okay, for chlorophyll. Is it for chlorophyll? Are you sure? Uh, for visitor. <laughs> I think, yeah, I think Jennifer is right though. It's more for something to do with nutrients, right? We had specific uh, kind of, not, it's not, I don't know whether it's nutrients or... Uh, for water quality. Sorry? For water quality. Okay, do you know what, what were you assessing? Yes, about the nutrients. So nutrients. Like what, what nutrients? Remind me again. Uh, ammonia. Nitrous. Ah. Okay, that's more proper. All right, good. So, you do have some recollection. Okay lah. So, the Kerja Lapangan trip was not all that um, wasted lah. It's, it's good memories. Okay. So, now, um, just having, oops, having that recap. So, the objectives of today is to define and to understand what is scientific method uh, and to describe some of the basic steps that you will be applying, not just for your final year subject, but also in extrapolating um, data from scientific papers. So the short term aspect of how this objectives can be applied is, of course, uh, immediately after me briefing you with this, you're going to have to be in your groups and uh, select specific uh, a specific journal with different titles, uh, and you would actually have to understand the scientific method applied in that journal. And um, um, basically, bearing in mind that your scientific method can actually be applied during your field sampling trip, your case study, and for long term, is very much useful for your final year project. So please bear in mind. Okay, so I will move on. Oops. Okay, what's happening now? Okay, so the basics of all science is what is science, okay? Uh, it's the evidence to construct testable explanations and predictions of natural phenomena as well as the knowledge generated through this process. Okay, it's very lengthy for you guys, I understand. But the key word I want to highlight here is the word evidence. Science is evidence-based. It's very different to the beliefs of creationism and whatnot because um, basically what science has to do is if there is proof, a presence of something, then that helps with your debate of understanding um, the environment around you. And the more evidence you have, the more robust and holistic your understanding of a certain topic will be. Okay, so again, keyword here is evidence-based. It's not about an opinion. It's not your preference. So, uh, this, I mean, sometimes it's debatable, more often not because there's no enough evidence, but it's not about, in particular, what you feel is right or what another person feels is right. Okay, and this is a very famous um, 
character in our marine science uh, you know study which is Jacques Cousteau he's one of the like like the main figures in marine science so I hope that you know when you go out and people ask Jacques Cousteau you are familiar with his work anyway uh, coming to scientific method so these are some of the basic step that one applies during scientific method. So the foundation of everything is, of course, it's triggered by observations. Just as, sim as simple as sitting down on Bidong Island, uh, on the beach of Bidong Island, looking out into the vast open ocean. I mean, you're enjoying the artistic view of, of your, the landscape, but at the same time, you have, as a scientist, you have to start thinking critically about your surroundings. And then from that, you start... Uh, sprouting out problems or questions. That doesn't have to necessarily mean problems per se, but anything of interest to you uh, that's got you triggered about a certain aspect of your work. And then from that, you formulate a hypothesis. And then, of course, you conduct the experiment to, um, to, to, to test if your hypothesis is right or not. You analyze those results. And, of course, you have a conclusion. However, this order... Of scientific method does not always apply which is depending on your discipline of study and without you guys realizing scientific method actually has been with us since we were actually young since we were babies so by right we were born as young scientists already so all of the steps that I mentioned just now we were already applying it as we were ch as we are children so the first one when I mentioned is observation is of course the child, the toddler, is here uh, sensing its surroundings with, you know, its eyes, its nose, uh, its hands, its senses and whatnot. And then from there, it's already thinking about, you know, the fact that you want to test. So it forms a, its own hypothesis. And then, of course, the next easiest thing to do in terms of performing experiment is to taste whether or not it's actually good. And then the reaction, the output is your analysis of your data. And then, of course, you would report your findings with other children and what, uh, and see whether they get the same effects. So, example, if actually this baby found a lime, probably that baby, the first toddler, actually found it very sour, or it gave it made it feel that he wanted to puke. But if you gave it to another child, it probably might be actually really um, interested in, you know, uh, tasting more lime, something like that. All right. So you all have been to Bidong Island. I see you guys enjoy in your video you enjoying yourselves playing and all so and then of course towards the end of the day you know all your hard work sweat and tears and puking on the boat it brought in such wonderful memories of course I'm sure but I hope while you're enjoying a trip on Bidong Island you would have probably made some form of observations that triggered you okay so again just like how the little toddler in the previous slide, you know, create simple observations. This too, as simple as it seems, you know, it can actually trigger certain observations. So, you know, you can develop something regarding, um, it's, uh, you know, uh, that can lead to experimentation. If I were with you physically, I'd be going one by one asking, you know, what sort of uh, interests or problems would you raise just from looking at this picture? Anything regarding the sun, birds, or the tides, or the composition of the fish. But, but sadly, since all of you are not here, so I leave it to you to actually, uh, you know, create your own imagination of what sort of problems or questions you'll ask. And remember how I did mention that uh, a research methodology, a scientific methodology, is not always direct in the order that I've mentioned. That is because sometimes we induce and deduce things differently. So the induct the aspect of induction uses separate observations to arrive to a general principle. Okay, whereas deduction uh, uses general principle to arrive to a specific conclusion. So if you look at the picture on the right, this is a very general basic one. So to deduce is you have an idea uh, in your head and a pres it's sort of an early presumption like all men are mortal. So in order to test this, you would then make the observation and then just so happen your subject, your first subject is Jason, who is a man. And since your idea is that all men are mortal, so then you make a sharing of 
Jason is mortal. An induction, however, is a little bit different where you made an observation first. And from that observation, pretty much like what I've mentioned in Pulau Bidong, um, it got you triggering ideas. And then from that idea, you had a theory and then your analysis is whatnot. So more often than not, more often than not, we are more um, towards induction where we make observations, we see certain patterns within our environment. Or the fact that when we are doing reviews, the a review is a form of observation because you are creating an idea in your head based on all of the readings that you have made about a certain pattern, a certain approach of a study. And so of, from that, you would actually uh, draw some sort of idea of what to expect. Okay, so just bear in mind when you're doing your final year project, there is a section of your final year project called a literature review. So from your literature review, you have to bear in mind, you, are, you have to be very holistic about your subject matter. Uh, and by being holistic, it's going back to the keywords. So from your keywords, you really have to go really detailed into understanding what is the work about so that um, you will then be able to draw some form of early hypothesis and early expectation or prediction of what your outcome is going to be. Okay? So I'll, I have another picture that gives that's more related to marine ecology. Okay, so um, in the first picture, you have an observation, okay, like all of these are fishes, all of gills. You're, you're, you're sort of extra, extrapolating certain data just by observing. Okay, so um, your first approach and induction um, is that, okay, one part of it is that all fishes have gills. And then from that, you look into a more specific hypothesis for, it. for each species of fish, the fish has gills. And then when you test it, you look at a wider range of specimens other than the one that we've seen, just to ensure that it's correct. And then, of course, you're going to test if your hypothesis is correct or not. So if it's accepted, then of course, uh, your general hypothesis is correct. Whereas in the other one, if you're looking... Again, it's, the hypothesis really depends on what your dependent and independent variables are. So basically, you know, some might be very straightforward. Some might be in the aspect of the one on the right. All marine organisms have gills. But then when you come to a whale, you realize that you don't have gills. So then, of course, you have to go back to the drawing board and go like, what's wrong? Um, how did you, you know, we were going back to the drawing board to see what sort of changes you should make. Okay, so these are things to expect. Why I'm emphasizing on this is that uh, I think we too early would like to sort of draw a conclusion of what to expect. But then sometimes our outcome actually, um, based on your data, based on your analysis, the output is a different, it's different compared to what you expected. So these things happen. And thus, when it comes to failures, it is very much a common thing to later achieving something that is very robust. So you have to open your, your mind and your heart and your sacrifices and your time to, to always, you know, realizing that what you have expected is not always what it is. And that is why you have a null and an alternative hypothesis. Okay, so this is where from all of that we have to formulate a hypothesis then. So a hypothesis is to predict a possible answer to the problem or the question. Okay, by right this should be up, not here. But anyway, so a tentative statement saying what you expect to find in your research. So if you want to download um, or get hold of some of your seniors to, to start having an idea what final year projects you want to do, please go and check out the uh, final year proposals. You will see it at one point um, towards the end of what you expect. And I think this is where many of the students quite kind of get it wrong because uh, they end up saying, say, example, like uh, there are sort of, there are a lot of fish diversity in Pulau Pidong. So when, when, they, when the question asks, is then what do you expect to find? Or you're expected to find a lot of fishes in Pulau Pidong. It's like that is already self explanatory. 
but you have to give more detailed answers based on your observation and based on the literature review. So when you say what to expect, you have to give more details, like okay, based on personal observation. Uh, yes, exactly, if I'm of too much over generalization. We have to be more specific. And this goes back towards um, looking back at your data, your observation. So based on your observation, based on, um, you, there's a term called personal communication. You can't personally communicate with your peers. Uh, this one is where you actually get reviews and get feedback from experts in the field who are expected to know this work. And just by chance, you aren't able to find uh, the expected data that you want from a published paper just yet. Okay, these things do happen. But more often than not, we always encourage you to find that data also from your literature review. I mean, meaning to say in your publications. So from your publication, then you have to go like, based on your reading of so and so and so, uh, we are expected to find more fishes from the, say, the, I don't know, the uh, from the family Karangi Day. Why? Because of the rich uh, plankton that it is. So that seems to attract more karangids uh, uh, com compared to other species. Or you're also able to find more uh, coral species for like Empyprion. Why? Because um, they actually like corals. Uh, a specific coral is found there. So you're expected to find that. So that is what I mean by details. Okay, don't put too much generalization. And again, it is not a random guess but a prediction based on existing knowledge. What is this existing knowledge? I repeat, uh, journals, your own personal observation, and feedback from experts in the field. Okay? So obviously then you want to um, formulate a hypothesis. So example, from your initial observation or your initial reading, you go that all predate predatory snails are venomous. Okay? But then you're obviously going to have to test it out if it's correct or not. So if you say all predatory snails, you have to look at the whole range of uh, species. You have to look at the whole range of, you know, what defines venom um, to a point of death or the presence of, you know, all those kind of things you have to take into mind. Or the fact that increasing temperature increases the rate of oxygen consumption. So you have to ensure what your variables are. You have the keywords here such as temperature, oxygen, crabs okay so again consumption for crabs but are you looking at a specific crab because different species uh, will consume oxygen differently again so these are things to bear in mind all right um prior to me moving to this how are we so far are you guys clear any issues you want to send me something in the chat box are you able to follow me well still okay clear uh, that's what I want. I want you to be clear. Because at any point, if you're getting lost, please stop me. Please let me know. So if all say clear, I will proceed. So now, remember how I mentioned that you are bound to have failures if certain things are not uh, looked into very detail in terms of you managing what sort of variables that you have in your experiment. So uh, this is where your null and your alternative hypothesis comes in. Okay, so when you have a null hypothesis, your null hypothesis is one that you expect not to happen. The alternative one is what that we actually expect to happen. Okay, so let's play around with an example here, a very small example here, okay? So the hypothesis here is that the Febrio papilloma virus causes tumors in green sea turtles. Okay. So if it's a null hypothesis, uh, can somebody give me an idea what the null approach will be for this hypothesis? Uh, you can chat or you can actually raise up your, you know, somebody, anybody. Again, I repeat, the null hypothesis is such that it's um, it's one that you don't expect, or it's not it's not going to happen. Does not cause beautiful. Yes, 
So the, in this case, the virus causes tumors in green turtles, but in this case, it does not cause. Very good. Thank you very much. How about another approach? Alternative approach. Um, another null hypo uh, approach. Uh, doctor, what about uh, the green sea turtles will not get affected by fibropapillomavirus? Uh, it's the same as what Irfan mentioned. Oh, okay. <laughs> but it's good. Yeah, good. All right. So that's all right. That's good. Wonderful. Now, how about the next one? Hermotypic corals exposed to temperatures above 36 degrees expel their R. Now, this one is going to be a bit tricky. You can play around with this more. Um, wait, uh, how, whoa, whoa, whoa. How do you get the dinoflagellate one again? Okay, you have to understand that. Ah, uh, yeah, exactly, Irfan. Thank you. Based on this slide. Okay, just real. Just make sure that you realize. Not uh, not. Just make sure that you realize. Not everything that does not means it's a null, because what if your hypothesis was actually does not? So then it would have to be it does. You know what I mean? So example, if this hypothesis, the alternative, was actually the Fibrio papilloma virus does not cause tumor in green sea turtle, then the approach would, the null would be actually it does. So it really depends on what your initial hypothesis would be, okay? So, okay, example here, hermotypic corals does not expel symbiotic zenzate in, uh, if temperatures are above, okay? If temperatures are above, okay. How, what else? See, the ones that uh, uh, you can actually, that means you can actually doesn't have to be does not, okay? So the fact that you say it, um, hermotypic corals exposed to, um, exposed to temperatures above, okay? So you can also, doesn't have to be does not. You can say it's below. You hear what I mean? It doesn't always have to sound like a negative approach. So your null would actually be yes. Faham ya? Okay. So the null will be, if this one is above 36, so the null will be that it will be below 36 or at 36. You see what I mean? So that's why your, your sentence has to be very clear that the moment you say above, anything above 36 degrees onwards. But your null can even have two approaches. One is immediately at 36 or the, or the fact that, I mean, of course, it's below, yeah. But it doesn't always have to be, uh, does not, you know. So, are you playing around with the, the what do you call this, um, the temperature itself? Or are you playing around with the zizu zantale? Exactly, exactly, exactly. Thanks, Irfan. So, I hope this is clear. So, now, about this hypothesis, naval explosion at the thermocline layer Cause hearing loss in whales. Doctor, color this one for a naval explosion above the thermocline layer cause hearing loss in whale bully. Sebagai null, yes, can? Oh, okay, that one. Because one add can. So if you got the above, boleh? So it's your null, boleh? Ah, bagus lah, correct. The idea is I want you to, to really get it because when you're going to do your report, based on the journal your group is choosing, you really need to grasp the idea of what the objective of the work is. 
And the thing with genesis is not a very straightforward um, written answer of the hypothesis. Some you're lucky enough will actually write it. So you're that, you know, the hypothesis and whatnot. But sometimes you yourself have to exp extrapolate that data. Okay, so good, good try. Thank you very much. Okay, so what's wrong with this hypothesis? Mermaids can never be observed, but they exist. I mean, technically you all know, but why can't we open our minds to it? Okay, put it this way. Uh, maybe this is too easy an example. But how about the fact that there are believers out there that the world is flat? And they even have their own proof. Okay. Yes. If you go to Facebook, you will have those of the like the pseudoscience that actually believe that the earth is flat. Flat earth society. Yes, exactly. Why I want to emphasize this is that um, it's interesting because it should be like a no-brainer thing that, you know, we shouldn't have to be able to talk about this. But it's because when you have societies that are misled or they go about uh, conflict of interest or they go about it as uh, some some political conspiracy theory, you know, that all these kind of things about. And this is what they want you to believe. Or the fact that uh, Bill Gates actually, they, they don't want to use this micro... Ah, exactly, Illuminati. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, in a way, yeah, it's true. The fact that they use microchips, you know, to, to put in you is not to check your vaccine, this one, whatnot, but it's actually to, to trace every aspect of your, um, you know, your being. And it's things like this are out there. But how would you justify that your purpose, your, I mean, it, whatnot, is, is true? Again, evidence. You have to, and in order to understand that evidence, you have to do research. So the flow, your design of your experiment has to be one that brings logic, brings um, a sense of purpose, closure, and of course, it's always robust. And it's replicable. Probably that's the best word I should use. It's replicable. If you do it, others should be able to apply what you do, which is why you have to publish your work. And then if others, you know, and if others were to find, hey, something is not quite right with this. Why am I, I'm doing exactly what you did, but I'm getting something different. That is where the alternative thing, the, the null hypothesis and the alternative uh, hypothesis has to be revised. Very much applicable with the fact that, you know, um, the strain of COVID-19 is always ever-changing. So the approaches is very different. Uh, different in a sense also because the kind of medicine that you apply, the vaccine, by right, vaccine should help um, in all aspects. But because humans, we ourselves are very different. Age is a factor. Our immune system is a factor. So all these things has to be taken into account. All right. So again, the more evidence you have, the more rob uh, the robust evidence you have, sorry, the more evidence you have, the more robust your data is and you have a better idea of what you're dealing with. Okay. So now we are coming to the expect, the aspect of experiment, okay? So you have the hypothesis, you have it all clear in your head, you know, you're like, you, you're expected to find this and whatnot. Now it's about forming the experiment. Um, again, not all um, research is experiment-based, okay? Because example, if you are like Jane Goodall and your work is about observing chimpanzees in the wild and looking into... Uh, the behavioral study. So that one can be a little bit tricky. So that one is called uh, pertinent observation. Okay. Experiments like such, like this, you have field observation, but you also have laboratory uh, observations that are more controlled. But you also have to bear in mind, whatever you have controlled may not necessarily apply in the field. Which is why it takes years to really ensure that whatever you're doing uh, doesn't sort of go out of hand. You don't bring in about invasive species. Um, there is there is a sense of control for biosafety and biohazard. You know, it's met a very strict SOP. You have to bring in so many industries to really make sure, um, you know, the work that you're doing is actually safe and has a good outcome for research, but without using it for biological weapons for mass destruction. Okay, so looking into this example, this is a very simple example. So your field observation here is looking into, um, okay, 
So basically how uh, our muscles like in terms of a different side. So your variables here includes, okay, if you notice the fact that it's a warm side and it's a cold side, so what you want to look at is in terms of temperature. So the fact that your temperature um, is going to be the one that is going to be changing, so that will be your um, independent variable. Your dependent variables will look at what is the outcome or how is it that it reacts. Okay, so example, muscle type, however, is a variable that is going to be controlled. That means, obviously, you want to use the muscles that are the same species. Because if you use a different muscle, obviously, it's going to be different. So you want to be able to observe how does temperature affect the factor. So in terms of its food consumption, um, you have to look into that. Water quality, do you want to ensure water quality is going to be controlled or is it different? Diseases, diseases is most likely to be a variable that is, uh, your, that is dependent based on the temperature because if it's a higher temperature, obviously uh, probably its immunity is sort of slacking so and that's why it's more prone to diseases. Whereas if it's a cooler temperature, it's more resistant. So again, there are so many variables out there but it is you who needs to know what type of variable does it stand for. Okay, so in a control laboratory, what is trying to show you that it's a little different compared to field observations because it's a bigger, broader area and it's very hard to control. So which is why you take a smaller subsample and you are able to test it better to see what, um, how is the outcome like of the temperature for the same species. Okay, so, okay, why is my screen hanging? Mm -hmm. Okay, so, uh, some technical uh, difficulties, but for the meantime, is this slide clear? Okay, that's good. I'm going to share it again, yeah, just hang on. Are you able to see my slide again, everyone? Okay, good. Yeah. Thanks. All right. So now, sometimes, other than variables, uh, you will probably have groups within the experiment. And the groups that I'm talking about here is, again, a control group, which, of course, you use as a standard, and it has to be a constant, a variable that remains the same. So example, um, are you going to use a group of these muscles of the same species as a group or just individuals, okay? The fact that it's gonna be a control group, you also have to realize that, um, are you also using adult phases of the muscles? Or are you using a particular size? Uh, are you using at a particular site location? Because perhaps the locations may actually differ. So these are things that you want to really keep in mind if it's a group control, um, what, how do you define a group here, a control group? Uh, and if it's an experimental group that change, of course you have, it's the same thing as applied by control, but the fact that you have a group that is independent and then another group that is dependent, okay? So, um, basically in pain studies, uh, this is just an example that I wanted to show. Uh, he wanted to see, pain wanted to see how, how is it that the pisaster starfish and blue mussels, how does it, uh, what is the effect of the removal of starfish towards the community structure? So by removing this pisaster, what will the diversity or the community of other organisms be like? Okay, so like any typical experiment, you have to do data collection. So you have to go to the field, you have to do your survey. Again, the type of of equipments that you use, the type of consumables that you use, all has to be taken into account, your data sheet. So during your field trip, yes, we give you a whole plethora of 
different activities to do and you're scrambling your head of your data sheet and whatnot, what you need to prepare, etc. But now, take in, bear in mind, you're doing your final year project, you're doing this very solely, all on your own, with some form of guidance from your supervisor. Why I want to emphasize on this is that your supervisors are, as the name suggests, supervised. They're not doing your work. By being a supervisor, they guide you and give you suggestions of how to conduct your work. But for your final year project, you have to be very independent of the work you do. Okay? So, and preferably, instead of your supervisor giving you suggestions of what to do, you would have to come up on suggestions uh, and ideas of how to design your experimental, uh, the experimental design of your work based on your readings or based from past experience and based from uh, feedback from others. So again, um, in this experiment, of course, he used a control site uh, that has Pisaster and another one, which is the experimental work, without the Pisaster. And of course, basically, the graph shows that um, the diversity of other organisms actually started to go lesser because um, Pisaster basically is a keystone species that actually controls other organisms in terms of their counts. Okay, so... Uh, it's a very simple study, but this is things that you can do, okay? Now, coming towards the end of my, my work is that, all right, so you will come to a stage in your final year project where you will start beginning to collect some data. And then from your data, which is your initial results, you have to start discussing why are you getting these results? Is it as expected as what you found in your literature? Are there slight differences? Is it because the place that you're at geographically is different. So does that mean that, say, temperature is the, the one that's affecting? So example, like, you want to look at diversity of corals, um, of this particular coral species in uh, Malaysia. But a lot of the work that you've been finding is such that it's in um, European waters. So, but what you would notice here is that when your data, in comparison to the ones in, say, um, in, in Europe, is such that it's more diverse, but it's smaller, etc. So obviously, you have to look back at what was the initial hypothesis of the experimental design of the previous author. Is your approach quite similar? Is different? All those are things you have to take into account, and which is why it's important for you to publish your work. So a lot of this published work, uh, the more commonly uh, used approach for scientists uh, and your lecturers uh, through journals, but people also do annual reports, say, example, with CIFDEC, um, with, with important bodies. Uh, we know with uh, Jabatan Perikanan Malaysia, so you have to do annual reports of, you know, the statistical report of whatever findings and consumption, etc. Uh, you may also present in proceedings. There are also workshop reports. There are all sorts of ways, but the most recognized um, work will be journals because it goes to a heavy review process that assesses your approach, your methodological approach, whether is it valid, does it have flaws. And um, so if being able to put your work out there in a journal is actually very good. And that is how you build your reputation as an expert in the field. Okay, so um, what do we do with the results of the experiments? Okay, so Again, you may form some interesting research that can help base, uh, can help citizens, can help community for, for food, for economy, for uh, you know exports, imports, whatever not. But on a bigger scale, if say the data is more cumulative, it's more holistic, it's more global. Um, can it form a scientific law or scientific theory in a larger scale? So what is a scientific law and scientific theory? Okay, so for scientific laws and theories, what the similarities are is whatever it is, it's both based on tested hypothesis. And the following step is that it's supported by a large body of empirical data. So meaning to say that it's not just your data that you're looking at, but it's cumulative of say, again, for those working on corals, so it's looking at a bigger aspect of 
all sorts of um, coral diversities worldwide to find to some form of conclusion of uh, you know similarities. And then it helps unify a particular field. As I mentioned, it can be into biology, physics, chemistry. I think ones that are very most apparent is physics and uh, for physics and chemistry, especially when you're forming a mathematical uh, formula that is that becomes a law later. Then accepted by the vast majority, um, if not all, scientists within a discipline, as I've mentioned, either biology, physics, chemistry, whichever. And scientific laws and scientific theories could be shown to be wrong at some time if there are data to suggest so. Again, science is evidence-based. So it's not that we want to be picky and keep changing our data all the time, but the more data you have, the more evidence you have, the more robust the approach of the topic would become. So in terms of the differences though, a law describes what nature does under certain conditions and will predict what will happen as long as those conditions are met. Uh, so usually, it's, again, uh, when it comes to a law, the law of gravity. So again, so these things are more into mathematical um, chemistry or physics-based work. When it comes to a theory, a theory explains how nature works. Uh, it's more common towards biology. So the man that I put down here, can you give me uh, an idea of who I'm talking about and what theory I'm talking about? Very much applied to the work that you guys do. Yes. Darwin. Very good. Theory of evolution. Very good. Okay, so you guys got it. Clever you all. So pretty much this is the end of my topic for scientific method. This is the recap. Uh, 